Thanks. We're going to keep going here. We've got uh, Tim in Wisconsin, and I'm going to let you, uh, Jim, start in with, with Tim because uh, – how are you, Tim? Doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. It says here that your kids wanted you to call in. Yeah, they did. Uh, my son, uh, Leo, and Luke asked me to call in. They are longtime listeners, and um, they thought it would be really funny to have me call in, so I'm calling in right now. And, oh, uh, wait, so they, sharing a little they want, bit of my story. They want you to call in. To amuse them, <laughs> and yes, and yes. you said yes. Yes, yeah. You're a great dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, you got points so far. Yeah. So I, All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Jim start in with this so that uh, so that because I think that possibly uh, your kids were waiting for me to uh, eviscerate uh, whatever it is that you were about to say, and I'm just not going to. Well, I'll be so. nice, but then you shouldn't disappoint All the right. kids by the end. Uh, no. Maybe after. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll we're glad, we we're glad you're here, Tim. Go ahead. All right. Well, uh, congratulations on your show. And I actually have a birthday coming up on March 14th this week. Uh, so mine's, the thir- mine's the 31st, so we're all March babies. Happy okay. birthdays. Hey, thank you. Well, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and uh, my parents through the, through the 70s and through the 80s uh, were part of the evangelical movement, and we moved there. And for a very long time, uh, I was very much involved with the evangelical community. And I raised my kids in a community church, but then um, my wife at the time, uh, her aunt really kept on giving me all these Catholic books. And I was like, I, you know, I, I really want to find out what the truth is. And so I started reading, and all the, the research that I uh, read about Christianity really pointed to the Roman Church. And so I made that switch, and we were going to church, and my son Luke, who has Asperger's, uh, just kept on sitting in the pews and just lying there during the church services. And so uh, one service uh, after catechism, we went to Dairy Queen. I said, Luke, you know, what's going on? And he just basically said, Dad, you know, I don't believe this anymore. And as a fundamentalist Christian, I was very concerned about his eternal future. Sure. And so we started having these arguments uh, and discussions back and forth. And so for me, as a Christian, I was more concerned about his eternal future and burning in hell. And so we started going back and forth, and he started sending me videos and then articles, and then I started getting books. And I started to do the research. And as I did the research, he uh, left for a trip to Mexico. And as he was in Mexico, I was reading all these books. To make a long story short, after I did all this research, and what, I, what I've concluded is that the origin of Christianity is in Rome, and there, there's actually a book that you can read called Caesar's Rome, if you're familiar with it. And what I've concluded in this is that all religions uh, are at equal standing. They have evolved just like culture, religion, and speech, and we are all part of the same global tribe. And so when my son came back, the very first thing I did was uh, I took all these books I had read, and I'm not going to get into the detail what those books were, but uh, that was one of them. Uh, And I had them in a plastic bag, and I set them on the table, and I bought him an ice cream. And then I sat down with him, and he was sitting right across from me. I said, Luke, I've done a lot of research. And, you know, basically, I told him, I said, you know what, you're right. And as I stood up, he just started to weep and cry, and I've never seen my son cry before because I felt and I stood in judgment over my son and his eternal future. And, and as a Christian, I was very concerned to that. So, and where I stand now with my faith if, uh, and religion is that they're all, all on equal grounds. I'm not an atheist. I am a theist. I would say that, you know, from the research that I've done, I'm probably more of an idealist than anything else. And I've done a lot of research, and I don't think uh, I'm here to convince any of your listeners or any of your viewers of what to believe or not to believe. I respect your views. It is a faith. It's a belief. It's very difficult to prove anything uh, because if, and I'll put that out there for both of us, if we're, if we're seeking the truth and we want to embrace the truth wherever it is, we're willing to go there. And we continue to have these discussions, and I think that's part of the reason why he wanted me to come on the show today. And as I've done my research, there's some things that don't necessarily prove 
that God exists, but definitely point toward a God. And I'm not talking about a personal God. I'm not talking about a genie that controls things, because if you, you know, watch one of my favorite movies, and it's Horace Gump, there's two questions that are asked in the movie. Are we uh, predestined like Lieutenant Dan, or are things like a box of chocolates, like Mama said? And I think we're in a time where, you know, you've got the free thoughts, you have a free will to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. There's some things within the Christian belief that people have a hard time explaining if God controls everything. And I'll just give you one simple example. If a baby is born and it passes away and there's no expression of faith, then some Christian beliefs, some Christian doctrines say that they uh, pass a special grace. But if the true uh, nature or the the fallen nature of man is in place, then that wouldn't really apply. But there's some doctrines say, well, there's a special grace here. And even within the Catholic faith, there's a special grace applied to Mary. Well, again, going back to religion, this is a creation of man, just like language is a creation of man, just like culture is a, is a creation of man, just like um, dress is a creation of man. And so I think we are in the very infancy, and I'm very, very because I am the very infancy of understanding how things really work. And the way I see the world now is totally different. I see the world globally. I see you. I see Jim, right, Jim, yep. uh, as my brothers on this planet. And we're all trying to do one thing. Uh, you, you've really thought about this. You're okay. trying to uncover the truth. There, and there's I'm a, trying there's... to uncover the truth. There's a lot to unpack there. I'm, yeah. to, let me, let me start and address this from a parent. One, I just want to say one more thing. Sure. Um, that, you know, you look at some of the greatest minds, like Einstein. I mean, Einstein basically said, you know, this, it's very, very difficult to understand. We see a universe marvelously arranged, obeying uh, certain laws. But we understand those laws dimly. Our limited mind cannot grasp the mysterious force that sways the constellation. And then uh, Nikola Tesla said, the idea came to me like in a flash of lightning. In, in an instant, the truth was revealed to him. There is no conflict between the ideal of religion and the ideal of science. He's wrong. And then, or uh, was wrong. Yeah. And Tim, the you other, said all... I, I just want to say one more thing. Yes, I keep saying that. In, re, in relationship to uh, uh, Max Planck. All matter originates and exists only by a virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force is the existence of a conscious, intelligent mind. And as I age, you know, I'm not the same person I was when I was a child. And some of my first memories as a child yeah. is when I walked out into the world and experienced the world. I did not know how to speak, but I could experience God. I felt God. I felt God's presence. I didn't know the words of God. I didn't know any church or any religion. And so that's what I carry with me, and that's why I believe in God. So it's a belief. Okay. You guys believe right now that there is no God? No, that's not the... I believe that there is a God. Okay, so we've got a million things to get to. Thank you for quoting so many scientists who I think are monumentally wrong on the subject. Uh, it doesn't add anything to either side to cite somebody, uh, you know, Max Planck was wrong, Einstein was wrong, uh, uh, Isaac Newton was wrong, uh, you know, but go ahead, Jim. I I'm going to let you pick apart a lot of these arguments, but the, the one thing that caught my attention as a parent, I have a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old. You know, and often as parents, we think it is our job to, you know, we bring up our children, we educate them. But I will tell you from having two amazing children, I learn as much from them oftentimes. And, and the fact that, you know, I think it's important you listen to your son and you have a conversation because a lot of parents, it can be very unhealthy when you have that view that you're going to burn in hell forever. And I've seen parents abandon their kids and, and that it can be so harmful. So, and I know you had those thoughts, but from what I hear, I'm hoping that, you know, you're actually having a dialogue and it's okay if you don't agree. And that, you know, most importantly of all these things is that this is your son and your family, and that is the most important thing. Absolutely. And so I, I want to thank you for that. Now, some of these arguments are where while you're listening, you're, it sounds like you're on this journey and went this path, and you went off the path quite a bit. And I'm going to let Matt talk about some of, some of these arguments and fallacies of, 
you can't say they're all true. Like, you know, validating all... Or that, all that's equal. Just, or all equal. That, that mean, That's we, just not possible. They're well, saying different things and contra- There's just we, no way. Yeah. Matt, take it away and have fun. So the first thing was, you mentioned a book called Caesar's Rome. Are you sure it wasn't a book called Caesar's Messiah? Oh, yes, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, I, my opinion, and it's the opinion of some others, is that that book is conspiracy theorist garbage. Um, and I really, you know, it's it's a mistake to portray Christianity as if it were invented in the 4th century by the Pope and the Masons. Um, the fact that there are similarities in stories doesn't lead to the conclusion that, uh, I believe that's, I think that's at will, uh, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion it gets to. But in any case, what it led you to was this notion that all religions are equal. And this is a common thing where people are, are trying to say, you know, religions are just man's failed attempt to all describe the same thing. But the truth is that the varying religions make very different claims about things. Some of them have similar claims, and that's not surprising. Uh, the notion that there is a God is a, is a natural transition from, hey, I'm a person and I have these capabilities, to maybe there's a super person who has better capabilities, to, well, then maybe there must be a maximally super person that has these capabilities. It's a natural progression, but that doesn't mean that it's remotely true. And I have a problem saying that all religions are equal or whatever because the nature of their claims aren't the same, and there are things we know. We know that Scientology is an invented fiction by L. Ron Hubbard. We know that Mormonism is a lie constructed by Joseph Smith, a con artist. So I can't put those on the same footing as other religions because we. I also believe that there are other religions that weren't done in the sense of intentionally constructing a lie. Instead, it's better, It's for me, it's more plausible that Human beings tried to solve problems and they told stories and they made mistakes and the ones that were most popular and least subject to being proven false are the ones that persist today. If you have a, a religion that says, oh, you know, lightning is, you know, uh, Odin, you know, chucking electricity down, well, okay, that could still be the case, but we understand enough about how electricity works, how lightning works, uh, that that seems to be a really kind of ridiculous claim. Whereas if you say, oh, well, we don't know anything beyond the Planck time, and uh, it seems philosophically intuitional that uh, something must have occurred to start off Big Bang cosmology or whatever cosmological model is correct. Um, and, you know, when Max Planck looks at it and, and says that, you know, we have to in, infer a mind behind this, I think he's just wrong. I think what, what the only reason that he's willing to infer a mind is because someone has already asserted a mind. And so when we're looking for what is the explanation for any phenomena, we make a list of all the candidate explanations, and then we try to evaluate how likely they are. You know, if there's a blood stain on my kitchen floor, is it more likely that somebody cut themselves while preparing food or that a serial killer came in and slaughtered somebody and then drug the body off? We know about the likelihood of those two events, and then we reach a more probable conclusion. The problem is, what if the third option is God placed blood on the floor of my kitchen just to fuck with me? Now, that's a completely unfalsifiable proposition. There's no way for me to show that that did not happen. And for somebody who thinks that a God is absolutely real and that a God may do this sort of thing to me, specifically for some purpose I can't understand then for them, that's going to appear as if it's the most plausible explanation, despite the fact that we don't have any evidence for God, we don't have anything to show how, pl- how probable it is that a God would do something like this. So in your case, moving from Catholicism um, away to, well, all these religions are, are equal or perhaps equally wrong or similarly wrong, whatever, but still believing in some base theism, the question that I have is, what convinces you that there's some God behind it? Because you, you ruled out a number of specific types of gods. Like, it seemed like you were almost arguing for a deistic view where there's a God that started it all off but does not intervene. And I and just, so I'm, I'm curious, do you think there's a God that intervenes in, in nature or intervenes in a personal sense? And what is it about what, what is the case that keeps you convinced after abandoning religious doctrine that there's still a God? Well, I, I referenced the, uh, and I apologize for talking so fast. Uh, me too. My, my son was texting me. My, my, my son was texting me, Dad, you're, you're talking too fast. So 
Um, it's probably a good idea. It keeps me I, from interrupting. <laughs> I think it goes back to when I was a kid. And I walked out. I, I couldn't speak. I was still in diapers. And I remember walking out the front porch and then walking out into the world. And the thought, without words, I didn't know what words were, didn't know how to speak. But I knew and felt that I was a creature within this place, whatever it was. I didn't know what the world was. I didn't know what the sky was. I couldn't even formulate it, but I just thought, you know, this is, I am part of this. And as I look at, uh, you know, quantum mechanics. Oh, boy. And, uh uh-oh. It looks like that God is holding us all together or a force is holding us all together. Okay, those are two different and things. Our, so a force con- okay, a force, force is force very God. a force is very ill-defined and a force doesn't necessarily have agency or any of the things that we attribute to God. But for, what I've heard so far is that you had self-awareness and no understanding of language and I'm presuming at this time that you also had no critical thinking skills and investigative skills and yet you reached a conclusion about a deity at that point that has just lingered with you your entire life? I don't know if I would even say it was a deity other than a feeling that I was a creature within this planet okay. and space. So do you, I do you think that's a good way to reach conclusions? I think it's a, it's a good intuition. I think we all have intuition. Is it possible to have a personal experience and be wrong? Well, of course it's possible. Then is that a good methodology is, to use to is come it up possible with to have an intuition that's not correct? Of course it's possible to have an intuition and be wrong. Okay, so how do we go about finding out whether or not an intuition is correct or not? Well, that's what I've done the research on. Okay. Where I'm kind so, of pointing to, you know, quantum... Okay, mechanics. quantum mechanics has nothing to do with a god. There's no god in math. There's no god in the calculations. The people who best understand quantum quantum mechanics certainly tend to not believe in a god. Um, but if you begin with this intuition that there is a god and you see something within quantum mechanics, something like you know spooky action at a distance, now you have a ready potential explanation that is consistent with that observation but is not necessarily tied to that observation. So the fact that there are things within quantum mechanics that we don't understand particularly well that might be consistent with god proposals and the fact that you're quick to like put god and force in the same category... We need something where you define a God distinctly and show a demonstration of why this God exists or likely exists. And it can't just be, oh, it seems like it would be a good explanation for this thing we've observed because that's what we've done forever. That's called God of the gaps. I think it it, kind of goes back to our conscious minds and our awareness. Okay. So, you know, this, this consciousness... And there, there are plenty of studies out there where, you know, people that have died have come back and have seen themselves on the operating table. Uh, uh, people that have uh, intuition with what's happening with other people if they pass away and, and just the overall connection. Um, I think okay, that so, might be... So first of all, consciousness isn't explained or understood. Second of all, near-death experiences are near-death and not death. And what we know about how the mind works is that a mind that is is in the process of dying, starved of oxygen and other things, uh, may not be functioning correctly. And that what most likely happens is that when somebody loses consciousness on an operating table and then comes to at a later time where they have been revived, what does the brain do? it tries to create a story that describes that missing period or that period of confusion. But even if somebody were accurately describing, let's say, a a trip to heaven, which has been faked and admitted to be faked even within the last year or so, but also people tend to see the religious iconography that they grew up with. Catholics tend to see Catholic iconography and Baptists tend to see Baptist iconography. And you very rarely get some crossover. You certainly aren't going to get it where people haven't been, you know, exposed at all to these things. But at the end of the day, let's say that Jim dies tomorrow on the table 
And after a, a fairly long time, let's say longer than anybody else, he, ha- he is now revived. And he comes to me and he's like, Matt, let me tell you what happened while I was out. Now, my first thing is, how the hell do you know what happened while you were out? Uh, the most reasonable conclusion is that your brain made something up after the fact. But setting aside that, I don't want to jump to conclusions. And he describes a trip to uh, his version of paradise. Now, let's say that he actually did experience all that. How does it in any way confirm that what he experienced is in fact real? And if he experienced that, how do we determine that the best explanation for that is that there is a God showing him a paradise and not some other explanation? Well, I think it's just faith. It's, it's your belief. It's your is, personal belief. Okay. Is there any position that you couldn't just take on faith? Couldn't I think white people are better than black people just on faith? Well, I don't, I don't know if I would agree. You, you don't think I could take that on any- faith? I think you could, I don't know if I like your example, is what I'm saying. Of course you don't. That's why I picked it. (laughs) I think you could pick a, you know, I could believe that this glass is the God of the universe. Now, is it 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 possible? Hang on, no, stop. Stop. We already agreed that intuitions can be wrong. And yet if you have to take an intuition on faith, then it would seem to follow, and I would hope that you would agree, that it's possible that you could take an intuition on faith that is in fact wrong, right? Of course you can. Okay. Now, if faith can lead you to correct and incorrect conclusions, then we should be able to agree that faith is not a reliable method for discovering the truth, correct? But we're both expressing faith. You're, you're saying you have a faith that there is no God. No, first of if all, was, no, it, no, stop, Tim, stop, seriously. I, I, I promise I'm trying to help you. I am not claiming that there are no gods, and I'm not claiming that that position, to whatever extent I have it, is based on faith. What I asked was, if it's possible for faith to affirm an incorrect intuition, then doesn't that mean that faith is not a reliable path to truth? That was the question. I know that's the question, but you're saying that faith... There's no but. Isn't this, isn't is a isn't yes, the, this is a yes or no question. Isn't the atheist position... No, and the atheist... No, stop, Tim, I swear. The atheist position is completely irrelevant to this conversation, just like the position on Bigfoot is irrelevant to the conversation, just like the position on God is irrelevant to this conversation. I'm talking about the methodology. If faith can lead you to true conclusions and false conclusions, then isn't faith an unreliable method for reaching the truth? That's it. It's an abstract about the methodology. If you are basing your belief on observable science, then I would have to agree. But if God exists, and if God exists out of time, outside of space-time, how could you ever conclude or be able to prove that God exists or doesn't exist? You can't, and that's why you could never be justified in believing in a God. If, you're, if your view is that you now believe in a God that could never be proved, then you are admitting you are engaged in an irrational act. You are affirming that you believe something is true and that you believe that you couldn't possibly be justified in believing that it's true. And the telling part of this is this was a very simple question that had nothing to do with God, no God, Bigfoot, whatever. It was intuitions can be right or wrong. And if you believe in intuition based on faith, it can still be right or wrong. And doesn't that mean that faith is not a reliable mechanism for discovering truth? And there's one and only one correct answer to that, and that is yes, but whatever is in your head would not allow you to say yes, even though you know that's the only answer, because you know that the follow-up question to that is, you just justified your intuition based on faith, and now you've acknowledged that faith is not a reliable path to truth, so how then can you justify your belief? And something inside your head knows that that's not the case, which is why you wouldn't answer that simple, obvious question. Where am I wrong? Okay. Where am I at all wrong? I think, I think based on logic, based on observable science, there's no way to prove that God exists within this space-time, if God exists outside of space-time. So doesn't that so, mean and doesn't that mean you would need s- some method other than science in order to have a justified belief of that? I don't know what method that would be. I don't either. 
But you provided a method, which is faith, which I pointed out is unreliable. So now, we, now we've eliminated faith as a good method to tell the truth. So we would need another method to tell the truth. And if you don't know what that method is, then isn't that an admission that you now believe something for which you have no reliable method to know that it's real? I believe something that I don't have science at the current moment to prove. Okay, we've established, we've established that you don't have science for it. What do you have? And how is it a reliable pathway to truth? Just an intuition and faith. Yep. And, and, and if we would agree that an intuition and faith does not necessarily lead to truth, and we agree on that, right? Mm -hmm. Then you don't have a reliable method for your belief, which means you cannot reasonably hold it. But on the flip side of that, science starts off with a idea, yes. a hypothesis, a belief, mm -hmm. and then they go no. through testing. No, what, and they go through measurement, and they go through and calculate. It's it's not it's so, okay. I I just want to correct this because you, you equated hypothesis with belief. The way we would typically describe this is that there's some observation. We need an explanation. We come up with a hypothesis. It's not a belief. It is a suspicion. It is a proposition about a possible explanation. And then we go and do the testing to confirm whether or not we have good reason to accept that this is a likely explanation. And then when we reach the point where this becomes a theory, which is the highest standard in science, that is not an assertion that we are absolutely certain or that this is the truth. All it means is this is the best supported model that best explains the observation and makes predictions in such a way that we can be reasonably confident that it's likely to be true. It's not an assertion about truth. But all that is secondary. Because if we spend time talking about how science would go about testing things, and you've already said that science can't confirm God, then it's pointless mm -hmm. to talk about science if we're talking about whether or not somebody can rationally believe in a God. So we would need another mechanism. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know what that mechanism would be. And whether I, we I don't either. It, whether we believe it or not, I mean, don't you believe that there is a truth out there? That, so, that either God exists, either God exists, or God, God does not exist. And I Correct. Guess I, Correct. I'm, choo I'm choosing. I'm choosing to believe in God because in the you don't, end, you don't choose I, what I you believe. You do not choose what you believe. You are either convinced or you're not, and you can be convinced for good reasons or bad reasons. But while I would agree that it is true that either some God exists or no God exists, that those are direct mm -hmm. logical negations. The proposition is: is belief in that there is a God warranted? And my answer is no, it's not warranted. That does not mean that belief that there's not a God is warranted because that proposition may be unfalsifiable. You could, you could come up with a God description that there's no way to prove it's false. And that means that you could not have a reasonable justification for accepting that. You would basically be claiming to have falsified the unfalsifiable in much the same way that you, Tim, have, cl have essentially claimed that you have um, detected the undetectable. If, if God is essentially undetectable and your method for detecting God is this unreliable thing of I have an intuition and faith, then you're essentially claiming you've detected the undetectable. I'm not asserting there are no gods. I'm certainly not exerting, asserting it with any degree of confidence or anything like that. My position is that the God claim has not demonstrated and met its burden of proof. The null hypothesis, the thing that we start with is kind of like a foundation. It's like you're innocent until proven guilty. We begin by assuming you're innocent and we have to build a burden of proof to show that you are in fact guilty. Similarly, if you view God as being accused of existing, we begin that God does not exist until such time as there's a demonstration of it. And when there is, then belief is warranted. And if that demonstration doesn't come, then we have to vote not guilty, which is not a statement that God doesn't exist. It's a statement that we have not demonstrated that God exists. That's the difference. Now, for some gods, for some God definitions, I absolutely believe they don't exist, and I think I can make a great case for it, including most versions of the Christian God. Tim mentioned he, he was reading books, and he, but he, you know, some of the conspiracy theory books, as you yeah. call it. Is there books you would recommend to take him down a path of, of some of these things that you would recommend? And Tim, would you read them? Or, or if we send them to you off air, either way, if we don't come up on the spot, would you actually re read them? The, the, first, the first two books that I recommend to everybody, even, even, you know, when they develop a more specific interest, there are other books to go to. But the, the first two books I always recommend, 
One book is a book called Innumeracy by John Allen Paulos. It has nothing to do with religion or that much about philosophy. It's about how bad we are at math and how prone we are to misunderstanding statistics. And it is a good starter book to kind of retrain your brain to be suspicious when you hear statistics and numbers. Like, oh, well, the odds of, uh, of RNA producing or evolving out of nothing are one to the 10 to blah, 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 blah. And, and it allows people, it's called a numeracy. The author is John Allen Paulus. It's one of the best life-changing books I've ever seen or read. Uh, it reminds me a lot of, of how much my life was changed by like James Burke and connections and the day the universe changed even more than Cosmos. The one book on religion that I tend to recommend to everybody because I think it's uh, it's really good. There's one problem chapter in it, but Guy P. Harrison, who's the author, and, and I spoke about it, and, and he understood why I objected. But Guy P. Harrison has a book called 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God, and each one's just a short little essay where you present a reason, and then Guy offers his thoughts on it. It's really good, it's accessible to anybody, and it will help people narrow down their focus on where they want to go further. You know, Do you need to go read the God delusion, or are you more focused on the science stuff, and then you, you go to Jerry Coyne's, you know, why evolution is true, and uh, then you, but if, if you're not as big on books, there are countless, you know, video sources, not only my, my own Atheist Debates Project where I go through stuff, but there's great, like, the William Lane Craig versus Sean Carroll debate is really good because you have an actual physicist pointing out that Bill Craig is not a physicist, and then that he's misusing a model. There's lots of great resources out there. But the key thing is, is to start training critical thinking skills and skepticism to, to get a foundation behind logical fallacies and syllogisms and why we need those structures. Because a lot of people think that if an argument is fallacious, that means the conclusion is false. And that's not the case. What it means is, if an argument is fallacious, that you cannot be confident the conclusion is true. However, if an argument's not fallacious, if it has a proper structure... If you accept the premises, you have to accept the conclusion. And where, when you come into conflict with that, you get into like, sorry for the, the technical terms, but a reductio ad absurdum where you're like, wait a minute, I don't accept this conclusion. That must mean that one of my premises is wrong. So if you begin with God exists as a premise and it leads you to a conclusion that contradicts some observation, then that, you know, if the conclusion is true, then the, one of the premises is wrong. And it may be that this one about God existing. But those are, those are the two books I tend to recommend. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on the show, and uh, I'll just make one final statement, and then I'll, I'll go. Okay. Uh, the way I can just summarize it is it's like I've been invited to a party, and I'm in the, the, the person that threw the party. I'm in their house. It's a beautiful house, and I feel that if I don't at least acknowledge the person that invited me to the party, uh, it's a disservice. And for me to say and to conclude, I, I just could not conclude because there is, as we already said, there's no way to prove it or disprove it. So I guess I lean on the side of believing there is a God because if God exists and I'm a creature of God, then in the end, the truth will be revealed. And I'd rather live my life at least being thankful that I was invited to the party. And with that, so, so let me, Thank let me so give much. you, let me give you one question to think about Tim, if you're there, are you there? I'm here. Okay. What if you think you're at a party but you're actually just standing out on the street with everybody else and nobody invited you there. How do you prove that you are at a party and were invited to the party? Not, not just that you feel you were invited to a party, because what you're describing is as if you were invited to the party of life. And as far as I can tell, the universe is entirely indifferent about us. I wasn't invited to this party of life. I'm just here on the street with everybody else. And sometimes we gather together in clusters and have fun, but that doesn't mean it was a, a structured invited party. And so finding, I think, that just goes, I think that just goes back to the origin of how you're feeling about it, thinking about it, and how I'm feeling about it. Even though it does get to the know, fact that we feel no, differently about it, but here's the thing: yeah. there should be a way to demonstrate that we are at a party that we were invited to. If I've ever been actually invited to a party, I have the invitation, and everybody else at the party says, "Hey, isn't this a good party?" And we all have invitations. So there's a way to demonstrate whether or not you were invited to a party. And if you can't demonstrate that, maybe you weren't. 
And I believe that it is demonstrative of the fact that we're here, that we exist, that we have a conscious mind, that we, you know, going through, we haven't even gotten into the whole evolution. Well, that's like saying that you believe you're at a party because I'm surrounded by people and we're all laughing and having a good time. That doesn't mean I'm at a party. The fact that those things are consistent with a party doesn't mean that it is a party. That I'm surrounded by a party with people that this is not my place. I didn't create it. I didn't create my body. I didn't create my mind. I didn't create any of this. My parents didn't do it. Yeah, but I you're mean, presuming they, they you're presuming that there's a who that created these things, when all yeah, of the e- when all of the evidence points to natural processes constructed these things. We are living things. We are the product of our parents. But we have conscious minds. So do my parents. That's why I have yeah. a conscious mind because I'm the descendant of creatures that had conscious minds. Tim, I'll leave you with this. Yeah. Listen to your kids. <laughs> and the fact that they got you, <laughs> and the fact that they got you to call in is a huge first step. And yeah. the fact that you were willing to call in and you made the premise that hey, my kids wanted me to come in for their amusement thinking, you know, that you would be ridiculed, which obviously you weren't, and we had a really good conversation. Yep. So I will commend you for that, but I hope you continue this journey and listen to your kids. Your kids need to know that you are in the top 1% of people who have ever called the show as far as having a good conversation. Yeah. And, and, and maybe we'll meet at, at, at a later date, and, uh, and if you go down this path, I think your views will be very much different a year from now, and I, and I would love to hear from you then. And if they're not, we'd All still right. love to hear from you. So thanks for your call, Tim. All I right. appreciate it.